Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for our exciting live discussion entitled The Genomics Collaborative, How to Design and, and Design the Future of Health Together. My name is Ruth O'Keefe, and I handle the education and marketing efforts at Think Genetics. Our goal is to provide trustworthy information to individuals with diagnosed and undiagnosed genetic conditions in order to empower them to get the help they need faster. Now, I would like to introduce to you our moderator, Don Laney. Don is a genetic counselor and assistant professor at Emory Department of Human Genetics, as well as a co-founder of Think Genetics. She is particularly suited to moderate this panel given her research interests in genetic conditions, clinic care of patients with Fabry disease, and her mission to help healthcare providers and people living with genetic conditions work together to reach common goals in research. And with that, I present to you Dawn Laney. Thank you, Ruth. I'm honored to be the moderator of today's session, the Genomics Collaborative, How to Design the Future of Health Together. As Ruth mentioned in our work at Think Genetic, our goal is to empower and educate uh, patients, caregivers, and those living with a genetic condition so that they can be more active with their healthcare providers and in support groups and advocacy groups. Um, this mission has a deep synergy with FDNA, who works very hard with their next generation phenotyping applications called Face to Gene to really try to educate, assist, and empower healthcare providers. If you put those together, you get our very exciting uh, webinar today focused on the Genomic Collaborative. This embodies an opportunity for patients, advocacy groups, and healthcare providers to work together and use this amazing technology to move forward and answer some key scientific questions. Today, our goals are to uh, help you guys, you all, you attendees, whether you're patient advocacy, genetic counselors, healthcare providers, or students, really understand how you can use the power of FDNA uh, with their next generation phenotyping to move forward and answer your key research questions. And our goal is that everybody will understand next steps and how to move forward if they've got a research idea and they're interested in joining the collaborative. So we've got a great lineup today and that's hopefully be very practical and useful and also tell you how it's been used to date. Um, to begin, I'm going to introduce each of our esteemed panelists, and then they're going to give a brief presentation, about five minutes each, that's going to tell you how they've already harnessed the power of the collaborative. Um, and then we'll have a moderated discussion. I've got some questions that I'll ask each of our panelists, and then we'll have a little bit of time for your questions as well. So I will pull those questions out and look at them and ask them uh, after we've done our moderated questions. But submit them as you have them, um, and we'll make a giant list. Uh, okay. So first, I'm very excited to introduce you to Dr. Karen Grip. Uh, she is the Professor of Pediatrics at Thomas Jefferson University and Chief of the Division of Medical Genetics at the AI DuPont Chief Hospital for Children. She's also the Chief Medical Officer of FDNA. You may also recognize her from the condition that she also helped describe, a May Grip Syndrome. I also would like to introduce you to Kara, Dr. Kara O'Neill. She's the scientific director at Cure San Filippo Foundation and a general pediatrician whose practice focuses on the care of children with special health needs. This is a wonderful role for her because she has experiences as a parent to a child with rare neurodegenerative disorder, and she can merge her knowledge, her practical experience, and her patient advocacy work to really give us a unique perspective on things. And last but not least is the fabulous Ileana Jacqueline, Manager of Patient Advocacy at FDNA, Coordinator of the Genomics Collaborative, and the author of Surviving and Thriving with an Individual Chronic Illness. Kicking off these three short presentations, we're going to start with Dr. Kara O'Neill, who is going to be sharing her unique perspective on the Genomic Collaborative from the advocacy and primary care side. Kara? Thank you. Thanks, Dawn, and to the Think Genetic and FDNA teams for inviting me to participate today. I'm really happy for the opportunity to share about how we're working together to advance understanding of San Filippo syndrome. Um, just a small bit of background. I personally came to be passionate about this disease the way many patient advocates become passionate, um, and that's through the diagnosis of a loved one. Uh, my daughter, Eliza, was diagnosed with San Filippo syndrome almost five years ago now. And since that time, we've been working to fund research for the development of treatments and one day a cure and taking on some really interesting advocacy projects. And that's where 
our collaborations with FDNA have come into play. Um, today, I'll start with a brief overview of sample EPO syndrome and then tell you about all the great things that we're doing with the face to gene team. Um, sample EPO syndrome is the most common of the mucopolysaccharidosis disorders, which is in the group of lysosomal storage diseases. Um, it's caused by an enzyme deficiency in one of the four enzymes that is needed to break down heparin sulfate. Um, the resulting buildup of this glycosaminoglycan, as well as secondary proteins like beta amyloid, PTAL, alpha-synuclein, gangliosides, and the neuroinflammation um, that results leads to the primary central nervous system neurodegenerative phenotype of Sampolipo syndrome. Early signs often include developmental delays, behavioral and sleep disturbances. Many children are diagnosed with autism. Um, however, there are effects on the whole body, notably you know, macrocephaly, recurrent ear infections, hepatosplenomegaly, and progressive coarsening facial features. This is an image of my daughter at 20 months, and you know, in hindsight, um, we can already see some of those features that I described. Um, also, you'll see in the MRI images below, siblings at six years old and nine years old, the dark areas are CSF spaced, and you'll see that that increases over time, showing uh, significant brain atrophy. So realizing, like with many rare diseases, we had an issue with diagnostic delay and that newborn screening um, wasn't just right around the corner. So we had to think about how we were going to access kids earlier and find them. Um, so it was you know, our fortune to meet the FDNA team at a genetics conference um, a couple of years ago. And I thought, wow, what a great tool to help us find kids earlier. Um, so the first step in that process was training the system to recognize Sanfilippo syndrome. Um, they helped us create a patient portal, and that was great for the patient community. They were excited to share, share their children, basically. We had 64 unique patients submit 614 photos. Um, the system was able to accurately identify MPS3B facial phenotype from unaffected controls and other MPS3 um, subtypes. Um, and we were able to present this poster at a conference. So that was exciting too. Um, building on that now established Gestalt and the face to gene platform, we asked the software if it could put together a natural history of the facial features for us. And while we generally understood that the face is coarsened over time, um, the clinical observation had never been formally studied via image analysis. The top set of images that you see here show composites of MPS3B patients at four different age groups. And we chose these age groups based on clinical relevance. And over the age progression, you see coarsening in the eyebrows, the nose, and the lips particularly. Um, what was really exciting to me about this was that we were able to pull out that early age group in the one to three-year-old range where symptoms are starting to become more apparent to doctors and parents um, we thought this is where we could possibly pick up children early. And the software was able to distinctly, with 95% accuracy, recognize MPS3B patients in the one to three year old age range from other syndromes and from unaffected controls. So that really validated kind of what we had hoped that the CIS tool might be for us. Um, that then led us. Uh, to our next kind of ongoing and forward-looking project in which we'd like to see this move into the primary care setting. You know, my background is in primary care, pediatrics, and this is where the children are. We, we would like to identify these kids before they have so many symptoms that they make it to the specialist. Um, you know, our goal here is to improve access to genetic care, more timely testing, and improve um, pediatricians' comfort level with genetic diseases and conditions. We've set up a list of triggers um, together in collaboration with Greenwood Genetic Center, the Face to Gene team, and Christine, um, to encourage pediatricians on how to use the software to help 
to help identify their patients. So we're excited to see where this will go. Thanks, Kara. It is pretty amazing to see what you're able to do using the phenotyping, particularly as someone who works in lysosomal storage diseases, that could be really helpful. Next up, we've got Dr. Karen Grip, and she's gonna tell us a little bit about her unique perspective on uh, looking at this from a medical geneticist. I look forward to telling you about how I use his to gene as a clinical geneticist. I want to give you two examples today, one of the clinical use and one of the use in a research setting. As you know, phase 2 gene is a suite of next generation phenotyping applications. And when I use it in clinic, I can use it directly on my cell phone. Shown here is the clinic view. I can, in the exam room, add a new case. And I want to tell you about a patient who came to see me with a history of intrauterine growth retardation, he had surgery to repair hypospadias, but he has short stature, microcephaly, attention deficit disorder, and the family was asking what's going on with him. This here is the photograph of the patient that I took in the app itself, and I provided a couple of additional data points here. The app ran the analysis, and amongst the potential matches was smith lindley opitz syndrome. So shown here is our patient's photograph next to the Gestalt image that the system has on smith lemmy opitz syndrome. So amongst more than 200 conditions, this is one where the system is very good at recognizing facial features that suggest overlap to this condition. And you can see here on this bar graph that the overlap is in the medium range. I can then add additional findings that our patient has, and I did that here, including the hyperactivity, IUGR, attention deficit disorder, and based on these features, the system then provides a feature match, and again, it was very high for this patient and this condition. And when I click on the heat map shown here, I can also look at the images. This here is the patient, this here is the gestalt from the system, in the hot colors, those are regions where the faces match very closely. And you see that the faces here are colored in red all over. So that suggests a match overall. So to make a long story short, based on this information, we were able to perform targeted testing for this one condition for this patient. And we were able to diagnose them with this condition. And that contrasts to many other situations where you don't have a good idea what the patient might have, you end up doing a lot of testing, including a next generation exome analysis. So this was a very straightforward analysis for the patient, and he had a diagnosis within a short time frame. Now I want to switch to the research application. So this is a different part of the app overall. Looking in the research application, we worked with AMA GRIP syndrome. This is a rare condition that was first recognized based on characteristic facial features. You see here the protruded mid face, often the small eyes, short palpebral fissures, and a short nose. These patients also have short stature and skeletal abnormalities, intellectual disability. They can have cataracts as well as hearing loss. And in 2015, the specific molecular cause was identified, so we can now confirm if a patient has this diagnosis. But it remains a very rare condition. And we wanted to know if the facial features of this cohort can be differentiated from other patient cohorts. And we chose specifically Down syndrome because previously the facial features had been reported as Down syndrome-like. So for the research, we were able to identify 13 unique individuals with AMA grip syndrome, and we uploaded one photograph each. We had a control of Down syndrome individuals, 20 patients with images, and we had typical individuals of Caucasian ancestry because almost all patients were of Caucasian ancestry. So these two were our control group. The system ran the analysis, and it gives output in different ways. These here are the composite images. So shown here is a composite of the 13 individuals with AMA grip syndrome. And shown here is a composite of the 20 individuals with Down syndrome. And shown here is a composite of the facial photographs of the 20 individuals with no particular 
syndromic diagnosis. And I think you can easily appreciate the characteristic facial features with the Amy Grip syndrome. You have relatively full eyebrows, small eyes, short nasal tips, a long philtrum. You recognize the facial features of Down syndrome. So this is very visually appealing. But the system can also provide statistical output. So in a binary comparison, two of these cohorts are compared to each other. So here we have the Amy Grip syndrome cohort compared to the Down syndrome cohort. And the analysis is performed in such a way that you receive a receiver operator characteristic curve here. You have the area under the curve as a numerical value as well as a T value. So this shows very good discrimination and because it gives you the statistical information, it is very objective. Similarly, in a multi-class classification, the system has three different buckets because we have the Amy Grip syndrome cohort, the Down syndrome, as well as the unaffected control. And for each photograph, the system has to decide which bucket to place it in. And you see here for the Amy Grip syndrome, 87% were placed in the right bucket. For Down syndrome, 98% were in the right bucket, so these are true positives. The unaffected controls had an 88% true positive rate. So overall, you get an output for the mean accuracy here. It would be 91%. And you want to compare that to the random chance for comparison. That would be 37% in this setup. So again, you get statistical data that are very helpful in terms of proving your impression in an objective manner. And that is very nice if you want to report or publicize your findings. So that's what I wanted to tell you about my use of the gene. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. That was a great example of uh, practical use of the face to gene suite of applications in research and in the clinic. Uh, next up, oops, sorry. Next up, we have Ilana, and uh, we are working on. In her dish, in addition to her roles at FDNA, Ilana's previous work in the rare disease space and her experiences as a rare patient disease advocate has inspired her interest in bringing together communities for a common goal of ending diagnostic delay. And she's very passionate about it. I'm gonna to talk to us about that now. Thank you so much. Um, before I dive into the kind of benefit our work has for the patient community and how we're working to help improve technology and access to it for the medical community, I wanna share a little bit about my personal story. Before I joined FDNA, I was the managing editor for Global Genes for five years where I worked one-on-one -on -one with patients to learn about obstacles they faced in their diagnostic odysseys. I got involved in this field because I am a rare disease patient, one who went 19 years of their life without a diagnosis. I've walked the same path as many undiagnosed patients and their families as they've searched for an answer, met doctors who ran full investigations, but didn't have the tools to come up with a diagnosis when it was most critical. I don't wanna watch my situation repeated not at a time when the advancements in science are so great and so available, if we just know where to look and who to reach out to. So at the end of this webinar, I hope you'll reach out to me and to all of us at FDNA's Genomics Collaborative so that we can work together in designing the future of health. So here's a little more about the background of the collaborative and who we're comprised of. We launched on World Rare Disease Day, February 28, 2018. The Collaborative is an open call for collaborations and crowdsourcing of information for the benefit of the entire medical community. And we work with patients, advocacy groups, healthcare providers, researchers, public health officials, labs, life science companies. FDA hopes to train face to gene on even more diseases based not only on facial analysis, but on other medical criteria as well, including things like medical imaging, blood tests, genetic sequencing, and other factors of next generation phenotyping. So as explained in the previous presentations, uh, the technology that we work with in the collaboration is pretty exciting. Uh, from a patient and advocacy point of view, here's a little more detail on how it works. How can patients, their physicians, and their advocacy groups play a role in discovery? As users from all over the world upload cases of diagnosed patients and their phenotypes and front-facing photos, we're able to train our artificial intelligence to recognize what these patients look like. Facial features become a mathematical descriptor, all at once protecting our patients' privacy and increasing the ability of our technology to learn. 
Symptoms or phenotypes become essential evidence in narrowing down which potential syndromes are present and should be tested for. Ultimately, that reduces the amount of testing that may need to be done to confirm a diagnosis. The technology uses the patient's photo and annotated features to give a list of syndromes related to the patient's symptoms and facial features. Our technology continues to learn by way of collaboration. So face gene uses real patient cases to learn about different phenotypes, some even unlisted in medical, uh, current medical databases. And together, we are able to expand general knowledge about different diseases and help physicians develop a greater familiarity with how these unique conditions present in patients of different ages, genders, and ethnicities. The app also gives physicians access to online medical databases forms to discuss diagnostic dilemmas, access to labs, and support with research. We're proud to have our technology being used in over 130 countries worldwide. Our goal with creating the Genomics Collaborative was to uh, increase collaborations with partners and FDNA's technology, involve patient advocacy groups, researchers, labs, life science companies, clinicians, and public health officials in the act of changing how research is accomplished. FDNA and collaborators are working together to design studies and capture and analyze patient data securely using portals and questionnaires. Among hundreds of successful projects to train this technology, some examples of successful collaborations include, as uh, Dr. Karen Neal mentioned earlier, a collaboration between FDNA, the Cure San Filippo Foundation, and Jonas Just Begun Foundation, which led to technology that successfully recognizes the facial phenotypes of patients with MPS3B, also known as San Filippo syndrome. A partnership with the KBG Foundation improved face to genes recognition of the KBG syndrome phenotype. And during the collaboration, KBG Foundation was able to more than triple the number of diagnosed cases globally. A collaboration with the Focus Foundation recently announced the successful recognition of the facial phenotype of 49XXXXY or 49er syndrome. Early diagnoses are crucial for patients because they allow patients and their carers to access therapies and community support, apply for clinical trials, and utilize resources early on. FDNA's face to gene technology is being used in the clinical and laboratory workflows of many participating collaborators, not only learning from analyzed cases, but providing insight back to the clinicians. There are infinite benefits of joining the collaborative's efforts. Uh, healthcare providers will have free access to new technology, access to resources like London Medical Database and Possum Web, a system to analyze and upload patient cases, a place to discuss complex cases, a place to discuss, sorry, a place to discuss complex uh, cases with other experts, and they'll also have a team to support them with new research theories uh, and scientific uh, publications. And if a discovery is made with the assistance of our technology by any of our partners, they'll have access to our research team who will help them build and submit to scientific publications, and they will receive full credit for their work, of course. New published discoveries will be added to international medical databases for instant availability to clinicians. Patient advocacy groups will find their populations growing as more patients are diagnosed, giving them a chance at earlier intervention, a place in clinical trials, a greater likelihood in some cases of developing the needed skills and behaviors and strengths to do things like walk, talk, communicate with their loved ones. With advocacy groups getting involved in this state-of-the-art research, they'll be fulfilling their duty to their patient communities to engage in disease understanding with no dent in their annual budgets and be able to focus their funds on other areas of needed support like awareness efforts, conferences, family meetings, patient outreach, and other truly crucial programs. Patients will earn a greater understanding of their disease as more experts become involved in the research. They'll have more families to connect with who are becoming, uh, who are going through similar health journey, journeys and will be empowered to help undiagnosed patients shorten that very long undiagnosed odyssey. So how does this collaboration work? 
The first step is to connect with us through www.genomicscollaborative.com. The link is right there on your screen uh, using our contact forms. We'll set up a time to discuss uh, how we can bring the research product to life by coordinating with existing partners, relevant experts, our research team, and the use of our technology. Next, we'll teach the participating partner clinicians how to upload cases through Facegene using either a single or team of user accounts or patients can receive a direct link uh, to a customized patient portal where they can upload photos, test results, and answer a questionnaire relating to the information needed to prove the theory. If a patient portal is involved, our team will provide you and your patients with ample information on our privacy standards, clear and concise directions to help to promote involvement in research. Lastly, working with our research team, we'll guide our involved partners through publishing the results of our research study and work to share our findings with the medical community. You can um, contact us again through genomicscollaborative.com and my contact information is right here as well. Thank you. Thanks, Alana. That was wonderful. Um, now we're thinking about moving to our next step, which is our moderated question section. And in this part of there, I'm going to start off by asking each of our esteemed panelists to tell us a little bit about how they've utilized the Genomic Collaborative and to answer a specific hypothesis or question. Uh, just to add a little bit of whimsy, I also, in order to know our panelists a little bit better, uh, asked them what their first paid job was and how it helped them in their role today. So let's start with Kara, then we'll go to Karen, and then go to Ilana. Kind of an off-topic job, but I worked at the movie theater in high school, and it was really fun. And, uh, you know, so maybe, maybe a little bit of the kid's side that uh, relates to my work in pediatrics. I like it. Uh, Karen, Dr. Grip. Thanks, students. And I think what I took away from that is to anticipate questions as they come up and to always try to be a few pages ahead of the people you're trying to teach something. No, oh, I like it. That's very useful. All right. And Ileana, what would you say? Um, so uh, I've worked as an author and an editor and advocate for the last uh, several years. And in regards to your first job question, I worked as a book reviewer as a teenager for local magazines and newspapers. And I think it was a great stepping stone for me, both into writing, publishing, and networking, and also into understanding that there were great worlds that I could access, even on days when I felt my sickest and couldn't leave my room. I love that job. I wish I had that one before I waitressed. <laughs> All right. It would have been fun. All right, Ilana, uh, I wonder if you would kick it off with telling us a little bit more about the creation and purpose of the collaborative. Yes. So the Genomics Collaborative was created after our Year of Discovery initiative, where we did this deep dive into different diseases each month for a year, working with many partners uh, to make new discoveries and bring awareness around different disease communities. But what we recognized was that a year of discovery is not enough. Uh, it must be a lifetime of discovery. We should always be learning, supporting communities, listening and working together with all that we have. CFDNA's story uh, really starts back in 2011 when our founding investors uh, sold their facial recognition technology to Facebook. You know, the tagging technology used on Facebook. Sure. Super interesting, but the desire was bigger than social recognition. It was really to have a profound impact on people's lives and healthcare. And um, with all signs pointing at genetics as having the potential to make that impact. And after meeting with the families, and the children facing the diseases firsthand, the decision was made that this technology would be used in this vein. And as I said, we will always be learning at the Genomics Collaborative and FDNA's invitation to patients, advocacy groups, doctors, researchers, life science companies, labs, and public health officials, that's a big group. We all invite them to learn with us to use our technology and to maximize the impact of that research. Wonderful, that's a great founding story. All right, and then next, you know, I find that working with families, there's a lot of questions that come up that don't have really good answers. And I was wondering, uh, particularly through the Genomics Collaborative, how Karen and Kara, you came up with your idea and how did you get started? 
So for me, that was pretty straightforward and obvious because I had this long-standing interest in this particular condition now called a May grip syndrome, and there was a long ongoing debate about how distinctive a condition is it, can you really recognize the patient, and the term Down syndrome-like facial features, I think, is, is in a way an unfortunate term, but it keeps being used. So for me, this was a very intuitive question, trying to get a little bit more objective with data that I felt strongly about on a subjective level. So it was a very um, easy choice for me to try to see if I could quantify and objectify data based on a small cohort of patients. And I find it very rewarding that, that with such a small cohort, you can truly achieve statistically meaningful data in terms of the recognition of distinctive facial features. So I found it very interesting for me to do. Mm -hmm. And it's critical with our small numbers that we do have in the genetic community. Great. Kara, what would you say? Um, you know, I alluded a little bit to this before, but, you know, the diagnostic delay, I think, was the real trigger for us, you know, in trying to find some way that we could help these patients get diagnosed earlier. And that really, you know, opened the door to exploring the FDNA technology and how it could be useful for our community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, particularly since treatments could be developed in different ways depending on the type of San Felipe you have. So it's more than just the clinical diagnosis. Right, and well, particularly trying to identify children earlier, we had come to realize that was gonna be so critical because the clinical trials were having age limits and cutoffs in which they were really only um, accepting children you know, very young children. And so mm -hmm. if we did not find enough uh, children within that age range, it would take longer to find effective treatment. Yeah, a critical issue facing all our genetic conditions that are progressive. All right, great, um, next up. Let's stick with you, Kara. I wonder uh, what results did you find from your project that you saw making a difference? I know we just talked about that a little bit, but how did you see it made a difference within the healthcare community that you work within? Did you find people finding more? Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think having a tool and the, the technology is just really cool. It's mm -hmm. interesting. And being able to present our research at conferences with posters, it draws a lot of people in. It draws a lot of interest. The images are interesting. It gives us an opportunity to talk not only about the disease, but also about this tool that can be used in their everyday practice. And so it's a win-win, you know, from both standpoints. Great, thanks. All right, let's move on to Ilana. Um, Ilana is an experienced patient empowerment advocate. How do you think the Genomic Collaborative meshes with the goals that groups that do support and advocacy have? Before coming to FDNA, I worked as, as, like I said, as the managing editor for Global Genes. And during my time there, I really had the ability to like, soak in what it is that rare disease communities really need and what these disease communities really need to accomplish. And first of all, the need is urgent always and in all ways. Um, you're dealing with families and children whose survival is a ticking clock. And, um, you know, the stakes are high. You need to figure out how to stretch off in limited funding across awareness campaigns and support services and research efforts. And we all want to hire our own research teams full time to take on large scale projects and registries in a way that's going to make a substantial difference, um, you know, to the community as a whole. And the collaborative is here for patient and advocacy groups as a resource to make this research possible at no cost. So our team will come in, we will fully support those essential research efforts that the funds from these nonprofits can continue to go and to support services, to awareness programs, and to have the ability to support the many new patients who will be diagnosed from this technology. So I think it's a really symbiotic, um, excellent relationship that we will do and will have. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It's almost a, a push start. Uh, Kara, did you find that when you started working within this space, the Genomics Collaborative did give you a boost so you could answer your questions a little bit easier and almost a guide to walk you through it? Which, um, you know, we worked specifically with Nicole um, at FDNA and she was just a great resource. I learned a ton. I had not previously done this kind of research. Um, 
so I, you know, I really enjoyed the opportunity to learn a lot about it, you know, me personally, and our community really enjoyed being engaged in the research and being able to share the images of their children. That sounds great. I can see how sharing your, your images could really make a difference for a family who's trying to figure out how they can do something themselves. Right. Particularly if it's, I'm not going to donate all my money. So. <laughs> Um, all right, Karen, can you tell us about some projects or uh, specific cases that are in process right now and how you've helped some healthcare providers get involved in the genome? For, uh, for healthcare providers, I think it is very easy to get involved if you have individuals with molecularly confirmed specific diagnoses, particularly if they are of non-Caucasian ancestry. If you upload their facial photograph and you provide the background information on the molecular diagnosis as well as on the ethnic background, that is information that will train the system. And something that the system certainly would benefit from is having individuals of non-Caucasian ancestry added to its repertoire of cases. So it's very helpful to upload patients who already have a specific diagnosis. But it's also helpful to upload cases where you don't have a diagnosis yet. Sometimes it, the system might be able to make suggestions that can point you in the right direction, as I tried to show in my first example, that can be quite helpful in the moment when you try to diagnose the patient. But also later on, you might learn that a patient has a fairly rare condition where there's a limited amount of information available. And my hope for the future of face to gene is also that it, the system will be able to connect patients that have a very similar profile, even if there's not a diagnostic term attached to this condition yet, but by learning several patients that have similar findings and problems, that gives the researchers tools to drill down deeper and to identify what the underlying condition is. So even for undiagnosed cases, uploading the images with a little bit of background information can be really helpful and might be rewarding in the future. So that's where I see this going. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Right, thank you. All right, Ilana, um, can you tell us a little bit about the future and what's in the works? I wonder as far as specific cases you're working on and, and how other advocacy groups can get involved? Yeah, we have some exciting projects that we're currently working on. Um, since we launched on World Rare Disease Day, um, we, we've had quite an influx of requests um, to open new projects. So just to name a few on that list, um, mm -hmm. we're working with diseases like MGLI-1, Kabuki syndrome, uh, USP7, Syngap, Ehlers-Danlos. Um, but again, our doors are open for collaboration and we have the capacity to continue taking on new projects. So please don't be shy in helping <laughs> us add your project to uh, you know, product or interest group to our list because every single disease is a priority for a patient who is living with it. And so it is priority to us. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And we actually have some students, some supervisors of genetic counselors who are looking for new projects. And it seems like this is a great way to get things going, particularly if you have a set year or two years to work on it, you can define the scope and move forward. Um, Kara, what would you say if a student researcher or a supervisor uh, what would you say they need to know as they work with the advocacy groups? Um, I, they just need to, you know, be open to learning about the disease, understanding the patient community, um, and be willing to collaborate. You know, I think, you know, from the patient advocacy side, we're always incredibly eager to get involved with students and, and scientists and anyone that wants to be engaged with our disease, we are thrilled. So, um, we, we make it easy. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. And I'm sure other groups have the same approach to it. Yeah. As yeah. long as you go in with an open mind and willing to learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. All right. Um, Ilana, let's see. Um, just to reiterate, what's the first step into re joining the Genomics Collaborative? And what would you say to a researcher they should do when they're working on a hypothesis? So everything, again, everything starts at our website, which is genomicscollaborative.com. Um, you can go to our contact page there and fill out your information. Let us know a little bit if you're a researcher or a clinician, um, you know, about if you have a hypothesis that you'd like to test with our technology. Um, but if you don't and you're just an advocacy group or if you're, you know, someone else in the community and you want to get involved, reach out, introduce yourselves, um, you know, let us know uh, how we might be able to help or, um, you know, 
vice versa. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, um, everything from the website goes straight to uh, my inbox and will involve our very team of experts uh, to evaluate each project's potential and see how we can, you know, best apply our technology to collaborate. That sounds great. And it sounds like it could be pretty flexible in what you're thinking of. Do you help scientists a little bit as they tweak their idea or do you just mainly go forward with their idea and, you know, pull in others as are needed? We have a great research team involved and a great clinical advisory board. So um, there's plenty of assistance if needed and, um, you know, plenty of advocacy groups to pull in. So sometimes I, I sit down and speak with the advocacy groups and kind of listen to things that they might want to know or things that they've found in their populations that are not in our medical databases yet. And it's just it's interesting stuff that we can investigate. You know, the more people that are involved, the more opportunities that come of it, uh, the more discovery there is to be had, so. Sounds good, thanks. All right, let's wrap up the moderated part of our session. Um, any other words of wisdom that you guys would give, would offer up to anybody who's interested in doing research in the Genomic Collaborative? Um, let's begin with Karen, and then we'll give Kara the final word. I would encourage people to, if you have an idea, bounce it off of other people and see if it's a workable project. I would say don't be shy in terms of asking and trying. Not everything is going to work out, but you'll be surprised how easy it is sometimes to move a project forward. Sounds good. Kara, what would you say? Yeah, I mean, I would reiterate that it was surprisingly easy to move these projects forward. Um, and, you know, from the patient advocacy side, having having families to be able to engage with something as simple as a portal and uploading photos that we have a million of, you know, on our phones, um, and then seeing that turn around into a research project with some answers and more knowledge about the disease in a very short time frame was just incredibly rewarding. So. I would just say, get started. Just get started. I love it. That's a great way to end. All right. Let's see. I'm going to take a look at some of the questions that have come in, and we'll just see who's most appropriate to answer them as we go. Um, I think here's a great question to start out with. Uh, Dr. Grip, how often is this technology helping you on a clinical diagnostic basis? And how many cases have you seen that have been diagnosed by face to gene so you can't diagnose somebody only by using face to gene. It's, it's not a diagnostic test. It is one way to assess a patient. I, I liken it to a PubMed search or to an OMEM search where you get useful information amongst a lot of other data. So it's not a diagnostic tool, but it's something that can give you an additional pointer. It can remind you of conditions that you might have thought about but didn't. Um, all of us in theory, should learn about all the 20,000 genes and the even more conditions associated with it, but it's not possible to be aware of every described condition and recognize it even in its mildest expression. So for that reason, I certainly like to use all the tools available to me. So I use phase to gene fairly frequently in clinic, obviously not in every patient, but it's because it's not always appropriate, it's not always helpful. If for example, a patient comes in with a cleft lip, there is nothing that face to gene could add to that particular assessment. So there are situations where it's not really helpful, but I use it regularly in my clinical approach, and I certainly will continue to use it regularly in my research approach. So as I was to describe a new condition or to assess patients in more detail, as I'm trying to describe the phenotype in more detail, I will continue to use this in order to get objective data because certainly for um, research publications or for presentations, you want to have objective data because that's what people look at. So for that reason, I also think it's a very useful tool that I will continue to use on a research basis. And it's very helpful that this is HIPAA compliant, so it's allowed to be used in the clinic and it's easy to get IRB approval on a research basis because it is already approved for clinical use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I have it, an interesting question that's been asked by a couple people that it would be great for Elena to answer. Um, it, this is about the cost. You know, when we look at a great tool like this, 
Can you explain a little bit about what it costs for research, how you would put into a budget, that sort of thing? My favorite question. <laughs> uh, because Space to Gene is a free application. Uh, it's for healthcare providers and the Genomics Collaborative also has no cost. There's no cost involved. We want these advocacy groups to save their money for other essential programs. <laughs> this is what we're here for. Um, you know, anyone wanting to participate can just reach out to us and we can answer questions and walk you through the process. But this is not a situation where there is a budget for, you know, advocacy groups or doctors or anyone who wants to use this technology. Come and join us. There's, there's no cost. So. <laughs> I love it. Um, we are still looking for some more questions. I've got a couple, but if people want to submit that through the chat or through um, other mechanisms or Q and A, that would be other place to submit them. Um, this question is again related to research. Um, uh, this actually may be Ilana or this could be Karen. Uh, when people come in to reach you with a research project, can it come from the advocacy group side or does it always need to be through a specific person like an MD or a PhD? It can come through the advocacy groups. Mm -hmm. um, you can reach out to I'm the manager of patient advocacy and the coordinator of the collaborative. Um, certainly if an advocacy group has a question, come to us. We are kind of like a um, you know, we're able to connect you and we want to put you in touch with the right people. It definitely takes a team to put together a full project like this. Um, but anyone can be a part of beginning that process. Uh, so certainly advocacy groups and patients can make that difference and bring it to us to, to learn and, and to, you know, begin. Sounds great. I like that. <laughs> because sometimes, you know, ideas will come in unexpected places when you talk about uh, maybe a parent who asks something over and over and again, you think, okay, I do need to research this some. They um, do, they do. And this is, I sit down and have conversations with advocacy groups and we'll be sitting there and looking at something and they'll be like, you know, I wonder if anyone, this is happening in our community and I don't see it anywhere in, you know, in the, in online or in any, you know, do doctors know about this? And it's like, I don't know. And we go back to the doctors and, you know, that's where it's like, we need to put it together. And that's what this, you know, platform and foundation is here for to build on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. And I would say, Kara, there's probably a lot of questions that you get in the support and advocacy realm, as well as in your pediatric practice, which have widespread applications across. I think when you talked about using this and rolling out uh, face to gene into the pediatric practice, that's huge to really help pediatricians who are busily running from ENT issue to ENT issue to really say, wait, let me take a second, look at this, see there's something I need to explore more. Yeah, I mean, pediatricians have an enormous amount of things that they have to cover over the breadth of infancy to adolescence and every bit of these patients' healthcare and their social lives. And so it is really a lot that's expected of pediatricians yeah. these days yeah. with all the anticipatory guidance and whatever. And you just can't have all of these rare genetic conditions at the forefront of your mind. So if there's a tool that can help you, you know, weave through that and, and not miss so many patients or get patients where they need to go quicker, um, mm -hmm. that's going to be a huge benefit to so many kids. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, I, I agree. Very cool. All right, I think that's the end of our questions, unless we've got a couple more that have popped up. Nope, that's it. Um, I wonder if, Ilana, you wouldn't wrap it up for us as our key person who's so passionate about this program and just let us know what our final last words are. I am so passionate about this. This is just, <laughs> it's such a great project and all the people involved in it are excellent. Um, so I think the last word is just reach out and visit us at our website, any of these websites up here with um, genomicscollaborative.com, fcna.com, thinkgenetic.com, and curesff.org. Um, and contact us through our contact forums or reach out to part of our team. We're always at genetics conferences, many conferences. Um, and we would love to talk with you and communicate and get started on building these projects. Let's do it. Let's Let's, let's make discovery. I love it. And I actually just signed up for a project myself that I'm going to work on with the students. So <laughs> you'll be hearing lots from me. Great. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.